Hi everyone. This is the first part of a two-part video going over some of the main points of Plato's Apology. Let me share the screen with you here. There we go. Okay. No, in this, as in my other expository videos, I will mix my own words with the author's words freely in my explanations without often quotation. I do this in an attempt to stay as true as I can to the author's original intent. In addition, I may include text that I glean from other sources in order to be as clear as I can about various concepts. In other words, this presentation is not intended to be an original work, and I take no credit for any of the ideas in this video except where explicitly stated. Before we begin, I would like to share a quote with you about the character of Socrates. This is by Dr. Martin Luther King. He says, just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create attention in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. Let me point out just a few things here. The first is the underlined, I'm gonna talk about the underlines here. Tension in the mind, this tension between doubt and wanting to understand is the kind of tension that Dr. King is speaking about here. So this is a kind of tension that is produced by the process of questioning in order to understand what is true and real. Next is the bondage of myths and half-truths. He is saying that ignorance is a kind of bondage of slavery, uh, a bondage or slavery, because not knowing makes us susceptible to manipulation from people more powerful than ourselves. The next point is objective appraisal. By this is meant that if one practices critical thinking, one can achieve an almost objective judgment or appraisal, because to think critically is to question our own beliefs and our own motivations. Next, the need of having nonviolent gadflies means that societies need to have nonviolent questioners to keep society on its toes. A gadfly is a kind of fly that stings horses, by the way. Socrates compares himself to a gadfly in the Apology, meaning that he stings the horse of state into making good decisions. This function of stinging society creates a tension in society to search for truth. This is necessary because once we become too comfortable with our beliefs, we start to believe what feels good instead of what's true. Finally, Socrates' life and the life of the critical thinker is to reach understanding. Dr. King here assumes that true understanding leads to mutual respect, powerful words, and a powerful work of praise for Socrates, the ideal role model for those more interested in reality than mere appearances. Here are seven questions to think about as we go over the points in the apology. What are the charges that the jury must consider? Socrates says he has gotten a bad reputation because he has a kind of wisdom. What is this wisdom? What is Socrates' answer to each charge? Why does Socrates think that the Athenians would be harming themselves rather than harming Socrates if they put him to death? What service has he provided to the city of Athens by philosophizing there? What does Socrates think he deserves for his crimes? Who does Socrates consider to be the true loser as a result of what he considers an unjust sentence? 
And why does Socrates think that an unexamined life is not worth living? First, a little background. Plato was born in 428 BCE, which means before the Common Era. This is the more modern designation of the more antiquated BC. When Plato was a young man, he associated with Socrates, who would engage people in conversations in the public square in Athens. They would talk about life and virtue and the world in ways that would make people think, and he would challenge people to not accept the status quo. Plato later wrote that Socrates, uh, sorry, Plato later wrote about Socrates in the form of little plays or conversations called dialogues. Socrates' habit of critically questioning the views of authority figures got him in trouble with the powers that be to the extent that he was eventually brought up on charges in the courts. The charges were essentially that he corrupted the youth and was an atheist, but behind it all, was probably a long-standing antipathy for his refusal to conform. In Plato's dialogue, the, Pop, the Apology, he defends himself against these and other charges. Incidentally, the meaning of the word apology here is defense, so he is giving here his defense speech. At the beginning of the dialogue, Socrates makes clear that he will get at the truth using arguments. He will not try to persuade the jury of 500 through the force of his eloquence. He says, that is what his accusers try to do, whereas Socrates is simply interested in the whole truth. There are two sets of charges against Socrates, the older charges and the newer charges. He will address the older charges first, as he says they are more dangerous than the newer charges. They are more dangerous because they consist of rumors from the time most of the jury were children, and Socrates does not even know who these accusers were talking about who these accusers were who were talking about him. Incidentally, when giving the views of philosophers of the past, the convention is to say them in the present tense. In these older charges, Socrates is said to be interested in speculating about the heavens below and the earth, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, speculating about the heaven above and the earth below, which means he essentially was theorizing about what we may now call natural science. Philosophers before Socrates, sometimes called pre-Socratic philosophers, speculated about what the world might be like and were unpopular because they did not accept the Greek religious stories about the gods. Socrates was also accused of making the worse argument appear to be the better argument. This is in reference to a group of teachers called sophists who would instruct the boys of wealthy families in rhetoric, which amounted to skills of persuasion. The sophists were seen by the citizenry as manipulators and opportunists, essentially the opposite of what Socrates stood for. So this was a huge insult to Socrates and misleading in the extreme for two reasons. First, the sophists took money for their teaching, while Socrates did not. Second, the sophists cared nothing about truth and even thought it was probably non-existent which Socrates cared very much about the truth, though he always claimed he, he himself knew nothing. Socrates argues against these charges with one simple challenge. If anyone has ever known him to talk about these things, then they should speak up and say so. Of course, no one spoke up because the charges were not true. Next, Socrates anticipates that the jury may ask themselves, why do these rumors exist if they are not true? This anticipation of what an opponent in an, in an argument or essay might say is a central aspect to critical thinking. For instance, in your papers for this class, you will be asked to entertain an objection to your thesis or one of your arguments. This is precisely what Socrates does here. In any case, Socrates says that the origin of these rumors come from his response to a statement by the Oracle of Delphi who was a kind of prophetess who lived in a cave and supposedly spoke to the god Apollo. Someone would ask the oracle a question. The oracle would have an exchange with the god. She would re then return and give a short cryptic answer. So in response to one of Socrates' friends, the oracle responded, there is no one wiser than Socrates. Not understanding what the god meant, Socrates set out to refute this claim. And by the way, looking for the truth by trying to refute a claim is essentially the same thing as is done in science, 
when a scientist tries to disprove a hypothesis in order to prove that the opposite is true. Again, this is basic critical thinking. So to refute the oracle, Socrates goes around Athens looking for men of different occupations who claim they are wise. Gradually, after questioning politicians, poets, and artisans, finding that they are not wise, he comes to realize in what way the oracle is right. <clears throat> that these so-called wise men know nothing, but they think that they know, whereas Socrates neither knows nor think, thinks that he knows. In other words, none of us human beings have perfect wisdom, and so to know that <clears throat> and admit it is actually to be wiser than someone who fools himself into thinking that he is wise. This ends part one of this video um, set on the apology.